Well, hello, everybody, and welcome or welcome back to the show in our whisperer, your show where we take you inside the mind of Hollywood's television showrunners. I'm your host, Andy Babak, Andy B, or just Andy, whatever you would like to call me. First of all, thank you so much for all the support of sharing the announcement that we did on March 1st. I was I was nervous sharing this with everyone after having worked on this for almost two years, but I appreciate all the support through retweets, follows, etc. I I also want to be, give a huge shout out to all of my team members on, on the show and whisperer, Julian Bell, who works on all the amazing visuals that you will see on, on the show, and also our media producer, and Nate Milton, who is a good longtime friend, one of the hosts of the Liberation Room here on Multiverse of Color, and someone who will be, you know, you will hear every once in a while on this podcast in the middle, just telling you a little about what Multiverse of Color is. And of course, our amazing composer, Mike Schmidt, a longtime friend as well, who has done wondrous things for the DC Podcast Network and uh, whose composure you will hear throughout this show. At each of at each of these episodes, I just wanted to give a little cold opening before we get to the actual episodes and actual interviews with these showrunners, because most of the time these interviews have been recorded many months back. So this isn't they, they don't really have any intro. We kind of just start the conversation. We talk about their entry into Hollywood and how they became showrunners. So, so first of all, what I just want to highlight to everyone, just remind everyone, is if you want to support this podcast, the best way to support this podcast and this show as we're early into this journey, is hitting that subscribe button. Whether you're on Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Amazon Music, Audible, you name it. I've been spending the last two or three weeks making sure that the podcast is available on as many podcast platforms as possible so that you can enjoy the podcast wherever you listen to your podcast at. So if you could just hit subscribe, of course, as you download the episode, and if you enjoyed what you hear on the show, hit that five-star rating. Give us a five-star review. Let us know what you enjoy about about this latest episode, about the podcast, and also what we can do to improve. Because here's the thing. I'm open for feedback. I'm always here to do my best to improve and grow and evolve any podcast that I'm part of, that I'm hosting and producing and editing, because you know you are, you guys are the reason why podcasts exist. You know, if there's no audience... These podcasts, they don't thrive. They don't succeed. So if you could do that for me, I would deeply appreciate it. Secondly, because I know I know there's always a lot of content creators that will listen to podcasts like this. If, for example, if there's something you hear on this podcast that you want to share with your audience through a YouTube video or your own podcast or write an article about it, if you write somewhere, that's awesome. I'm so happy you enjoy it. All I ask, if you could just link back to where you heard it, you know, to the original episode, that would be deeply appreciated. On social media, you can tag us. Please tag us on the appropriate handles. I will link them in the description below here on YouTube and in the blog post for the audio version of this episode. So because we, you know, we want people to know where they get information from. You know, we always try, we always want to make sure that we credit original sources. And I'm sure a lot of you out there do too. So if you could do that for us. We would deeply appreciate it. Uh, but for this first episode, I am so excited to get, to share with you guys that I had the, the distinct honor of chatting with Keto Shimizu, who is one of the co-showrunners of DC's Legends Tomorrow. DC's Legends Tomorrow was one of the four big flagship shows in the Arrowverse on the CW, and it ran for seven seasons, focusing on several heroes from the Arrowverse franchise across the, the, the various shows of heroes that we've already known for a while, but also getting new new faces across space and time through the past, the present, and sometimes the future as they p- together protect timeline from various supervillains, various threats, but also telling compelling stories about maybe voices and faces that you don't always see on your screens. And I we had a lovely conversation. Keto was my first guest that I had. She was the first one who responded when I was reaching out to showrunners. Lovely conversation about how she got into Hollywood, how she got her you know start as a showrunner. And I'm excited for you guys to hear her story, some of the things that you may not have heard before, some things that could have happened if, for example, the show had come back from another season and what she, and where she's going in the future, especially post Writers Guild of America strike, because this was right after the strike was finally over. So 
I'm excited for you guys to hear this. And you'll ha- you'll hear you'll hear me at the end of, of the show after the interview. So I'm gonna stop talking and let you guys enjoy episode one of the show and whisper. Enjoy, guys. I will see you at the end. <laughs> So first of all, welcome. You're our first guest on uh, what we're calling it, uh, the showrunner whisperer. How are you doing today, Keto? I'm doing all right. Yeah, things are things are okay here. First of all, it's, it's interesting because we, uh, we 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 reached out a couple months ago, uh, right before right before the strike ha- happened. So I'm glad we were able to do this, you know, so many months later. But I feel like I, ca- I can't start this conversation without addressing the strike. But like first of all, you know, congrats on what was obviously a, a long battle how wh- how are you today with everything that has, that has happened now since these hollywood strikes the strike i'm really i'm so proud of my union and just how hard we fought for the deal that we needed to get in order to make sure that our vocation survives you know through the an ever-changing media landscape yes i'm so i i was there on the picket lines you know multiple times a week i firmly believed in everything that we were doing and and the points that needed to be addressed in order to move forward on a deal. And I think in the long run, it is going to be okay <laughs> for our industry. But right now, it's just, it's hard. It's slow ramping back into everything that I was working on before the strike. Uh, there was a lot of momentum and then the strike happened and now it's just very 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 yeah it's it's slow and and it's frustrating because you know i expected that when you know we would be back <laughs> that we would be back and you know there would be decisions having been made and you know the next step on things or you know the we're actually not doing this project anymore. Goodbye, which in and of itself is closure and allows me to say, okay, that is over and I'm on to the next five other things that I've been juggling. So for me personally, just because I'm not on a show currently shooting, it's been a bit frustrating. <laughs> just hoping that things will pick back up and they just they just haven't, you know, and I know that everyone's waiting to see how the actor strike resolves. And that is hopefully coming to a close as well with them also, you know, having fought a very tough fight. And now, of course, everyone is just looking to the new year. Everyone is saying in the new year, things will happen. And meanwhile, you know, for me personally, it's like, well, you know, I've been not working since May. <laughs> and before that, since Legends ended, you know, I I had some work that paid, but not a lot of work that paid. And it's, you know, we can only we can only drain our savings for so long. So I'm really am hopeful that in the new year things do pick up and that decisions are made and that, you know, my slate uh, gets going a little bit more actively. No, absolutely. I mean, it's definitely been I mean, you know, we knew that, you know, because again, as someone who grew up watching the whole 2008 strike to begin with, you know, seeing this happen again, almost barely 20 years afterwards and seeing how long this went on, but also seeing like how some of these Hollywood players, like some of the true colors coming out, because, you know, you see, you know, you see all these crazy headlines in the, in the trades and so on, where some executives saying, you know, we're just going to wait till they lose their homes and so on. And, and just, you just kind of think, Hey, you need our script to get content. And it's like, why are you like, why are you fighting us like this? Yeah, that was that was very hurtful. <laughs> but of course, you know, we're a guild that never takes things like that on the chin. I mean, I think ultimately having that statement in the press fired us up. You know, it was at a point where we are, we were all hurting, you know, we were all um tired, but still, you know, very engaged in the, in the strike, but having that, you know, that person say those things and have it end up, you know, in deadline really 
really made us angry and really got, I think I really re so. re energized us in a way and, you know, just determined that like, no, you are not going to win in that way. And your, your greed is not going to, um, is, is not going to be the thing that lasts, uh, you know, through a, to the end. Like we are going to prevail and help each other and be there for one another. And yes, it's going to hurt us financially and, some some of us certainly more than others, but it's not a fight that we're backing down from. So it, it, at the end of the day, you know, words like that um, and several other instances of things being leaked to the press, um, you know, backfired, I think. Yeah, no, no, for sure. No, by, uh, but once again, I am uh, proud of what you and all your colleagues and members at the Guild accomplished. And I, you know, again, yes, I totally understood the first rainwriter that, you know, kind of going through a dry spell right now in terms of not having much to work on as, the, you know, the industry is kind of still getting back up on its feet after everything. But I, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping, crossing my fingers, that 2024 will come swiftly with uh, new adventures uh, because, you know, we, it's time, it's, you know, it's time to get back to work. So I totally, I totally understand that. The question that I'm always going to be posing to my guests on on the showrunner whisper every week, every time, is what is your definition of a showrunner? Hmm. A, uh, I believe that a showrunner is, you know, the the CEO essentially of the company that is the TV show in question. You know, they are the ones who have to make all the major decisions, both creatively and uh, managerially for the production as a company to survive and for all the employees therein to, um, you know, work harmoniously together with and uh, for the product itself to be excellent, you know? So it's, it's not an entirely creative position, which can be a shock to some people who, you know, um, who find themselves in the position of showrunner, having not really climbed the ranks um, of of multiple TV shows, and um, you know, there is certainly the creative aspect of it, which is that you break stories and you are the one saying yay or nay to pitches and building your series and season and episode arcs. Um, day by day. Uh, so that's certainly a large portion of the job. But what I learned, you know, both from going through the showrunner training program that the Writers Guild offers and doing the job uh, itself <laughs> is that a lot of the job is is really, you know, it's it's really just about being a good manager. And that means, you know, juggling a lot of different kinds of personalities and being able to solve problems nimbly and compassionately and being a really good communicator and being a available <laughs> at crazy hours to answer questions and to make sure that everyone knows what the plan is and, you know, um, and to, you know, really be alert and uh, able to move between departments um, seamlessly, <laughs> you know, be, be in a story meeting and then suddenly be in post and then suddenly be on a notes call and then suddenly have to resolve an issue with an actor and then, you know, having to talk to, you know, your, your line producer about the budget and, you know, just you have to move throughout your day um, to all these different areas and you have to do so, um, you know, being fully oh, able to answer all questions and help solve any issues that have arisen from whatever um, episode or, uh, or, or yeah, I guess whatever episode you're working on that day. Um, but for a showrunner, you're working on multiple episodes on any given day because you're, you're breaking one and you're reading another and you're producing another and you're in post-production on another and you're finalizing VFX for another. And it's just, uh, it's, it's a juggling act and to be a, good showrunner, I think you have to have a personality that is open and um, patient. <laughs> and, um, you know, how you have to have a mind that's able to sort of take in a lot of information and synthesize and weed out what's not important and uh, pinpoint what is important, what needs your attention, what doesn't. Um, I think it also is really 
important for a showrunner to have people on their team that can be their um, support in terms of delegation. I think it's really critical to trust the people around you to be able to handle some of the things that you know they can, you know, and that's a large part of it is, again, it's management. It's management. It's a, it's really about figuring out the way to build your team and make sure all pieces are running smoothly at any given moment. And, you know, I, I really take the, the motto of the showrunner training program to heart, which is like, you know, quality scripts on time. <laughs> and the, the quality scripts, of course, is you want your stories to be moving and exciting and entertaining and all the good things that you want in a TV show. But the on time part is what allows production to make the thing. <laughs> and, um, you know, that's sort of the core of it. But then everything else is, you know, all these moving parts and understanding what every department needs from you and to be available to provide that. Well, for those who may not may not know your your background because you know again you know <laughs> as someone me i followed the Arrowverse since like when it was like basically born so for people who do not like if they had to pick up issues issue one of your secret origin story of ending the world of writing like where like where did this all start well i you know i actually started on a short-lived nbc drama called the cape that was my very first staff writing job i didn't write any of the episodes but i did help break them. And <laughs> that was really my, my first foray into TV writing period. I had done the NBC Writers on the Verge Fellowship, which helped me, you know, get in front of the showrunners for the Cape at the right moment. Um, but before then, I'd worked in post-production. So I, you know, hadn't, I didn't do the typical, uh, you know, going through support staff uh, to get my first staff position, which a lot of writers do, and I think is incredibly valuable. And certainly, you know, growing through the ranks is something I try to foster on the shows that I that I run. But I, uh, so I was thrust into it as a staff writer and was very fortunate that I got a really great education, even on the short-lived show. Um, Being Human, um, the sci-fi series, is so dear to my heart. I was on there for two seasons, and that is where I grew the most, I think, from just having been such a green writer on on the Cape and not really having a chance to write or produce to getting to write an episode, you know, fully with my name on it and getting to produce it up in Canada and to get to work in this really wonderful genre mashup of horror and comedy and and you know really beautiful interpersonal drama this coming of age story and uh you know but with monsters and that that show still is one of the things i'm the most proud of but then yeah and then i moved into the arrowverse and the arrowverse is where i i really <laughs> matured as a writer and as a producer and ultimately got to co-run legends with phil which was which is um uh, an absolutely wonderful experience. And that's also the show that I was on when I got married and started my family and, you know, juggled motherhood and, you know, being a showrunner and <laughs> all these things that are really challenging. But I was in a very safe and very nurturing environment. And Greg Berlanti, who has, was always incredibly supportive, Mark Guggenheim, who pulled me into Arrow in the first place, and then you know, brought me onto Legends and then supported my rise. Like, you know, I, I learned so much from these shows and had such a wonderful job, uh, wonderful time, you know, at every level, learning and and being thrust into problem solving and getting to be in the thick of it. Uh, it was it was wonderful. And I am really, really grateful for the time that I had there. Can you take me back to the day when, because again, I, I don't know what it's like to get the call that, uh, uh you know, whether it's from Greg or if it's from Mark saying, you know, hey, how would you feel about becoming our, because in season one, I think Phil was the only, uh, Phil, I think Phil and Mark were co-showrunners and then you came yeah. in in season two, correct? I came in in season two as a co-EP. So that was, you know, I was, I basically came in and, and moving from Arrow to Legends, I 
requested of Mark that I get a chance to start running the writer's room and to get the the bump up to co-EP making that move. And he was very supportive of it. Greg was supportive of it. I hadn't really worked with Phil at that point, but I, I knew him just from, you know, being on the lot together. And he was very supportive of it as well. So I came in and was sort of the you know, number two, I guess, in the room, someone who was, who would be uh, breaking story and leading the story discussions in the room, trying to hit all those goalposts. And of course I was doing that as a new mom. So that was extra fun having to do all of that in between, you know, squirreling away into my office to pump breast milk and having to leave early enough to put my baby to bed and all that stuff. But it all worked out. It was great. And it was really wonderful getting to be a part of the reimagining of what legends could be because season two is really where the show started to branch out and find its comedic voice and become, you know, less of your traditional superhero fare and more of your subversive and, uh, you know, genre hopping fun romp um, that, you know, always, always, rested on the emotional storytelling, but had so much fun um, all in all. Uh, so that was, that was, in, that was really great to be part of. Well, that, that's, that's so inspiring to hear that, that you were the one kind of like took the initiative of like, Hey, I want to run the room because, you know, because like every, every showrunner, you know, who gets into this position, you know, they, you know, they, you know, they have a different story. Some will either be offered that, or, you know, maybe, you know, in your case, you're the one who kind of like, ask for it which is you know again i think do you think we need do you think is that something you think future showrunners need to do more of of kind of like hey you know what like i think it's my time i think it's i'm ready to do this can i do this can i get the chance to do this i mean i think you always have to read the room <laughs> you know like know sort of what's available and what you're really capable of doing in that moment um and in this particular moment the show was undergoing a massive transition. Um, a lot of writers were leaving uh, and they were really looking to change the identity of the show. I had been on Arrow for you know, a full three-year contract. I recognized on Arrow that I didn't have room to grow there. There were already people lined up to take on leadership positions and to ultimately grow into showrunners over there. And I had no intention of competing with that. I was like, yeah, I want Beth Schwartz to be running this show in a couple of years. I don't, I don't, you know, I don't want to stand in her way. And I also don't, but I also don't want to get trapped in sort of a, you know, a middle position where I don't have creative uh, or, you know, these, these sort of higher creative responsibilities. I really wanted that challenge and I knew I could do it. So the opportunity to move over to Legends came about, and I re recognized, you know, an opportunity. I said, there's, there's, a, there's a space here um, for me to fill. And I, yeah, so I asked for it. And they, uh, you know, again, I was, I was moving into a very uh, familiar setting. These were people who I largely knew very well, you know, people like Mark. Um, and I knew Phil was really kind and a generous person. So I knew that he probably wouldn't balk at, you know, someone he didn't know closely coming in and wanting that position. And yeah, so it was, again, it was, it was a, a friendly room <laughs> and people who wanted me to grow and wanted me to, to rise to the occasion. And when I presented the idea, Mark just sort of was like, wow. Yeah. You know, like he was excited about it. And um, he, you know, he hadn't thought of it himself, uh, which is why I had to point it out, you know, but again, that's that, that happens almost all the time. It's like, people aren't necessarily going to think about your career trajectory. You have to present the idea to them. You know, again, if it's a, if it's a space where you have that support in, in place. And thankfully I did because Mark was a, you know, a dear friend and, and had already been a mentor to me. So it was, uh, I, I knew that I could ask for it without worrying, um, about, you know, if, if it didn't work out any sort of weird negative, um, fallback or fallout from all of it. You were talking earlier about going to the 
the rougher parts, you know, of being a showrunner of like, you know, you know, that it's, you know, it, it's very much about management. It's about, you know, r- running like a company as someone who is a journalist who co- kind of just sees from a fan perspective a lot, like what, what fans are expecting or thinking that a showrunner does. It is if there's one misconception that you as a showrunner personally would like to clarify that you that you see all the time that people that, you know, fans have these expectations or think this is the way it is. What what would that be, in your opinion? Ooh, that's a really interesting question. I I don't know that the fans necessarily get it wrong. I think that they, for the most part, understand that, you know, most of the creative uh, side of things does ultimately go through the showrunner, at least. <laughs> but uh, I would say one thing that they sometimes don't understand is like how many other factors play into story decisions. (laughs) And if a storyline isn't playing out the way that the fans want, um, you know, there's, we, we thought about all angles, you know, it's not that uh, we're just doing it to piss, piss off fans or to uh, turn left because they want us to turn right. You know, it really is. There's so many different pieces of the puzzle that are in play. There's pressures from the network. There's pressures from the studio. There's, you know, pressures from the actors. You know, if, if an actor wants off the show and then guess what, we got to figure out a way to gracefully write them off the show or, you know, it's, it's, there's a lot of things at play. Um, we don't ever have like complete control of, of the, the way that these stories go because, it's a living organism and, you know, things change. We see things in dailies that make us realize like, oh, wow, that, that wrote, that story's not working. We got to move this way. You know, oh, these two characters have a lot of chemistry. Let's lean into that. You know, like there's, there's just a lot, um, there's a lot going on. And again, you have to be nimble, not fight when something that's working is pushing story in a different direction than you thought it would go. So, yeah, I think, I think the notion that like a showrunner is the like end all be all of story and you know, it's just, that's just not the case. It's, there's so many other pieces that go into what ultimately (laughs) plays out in front of you on your TV screens. And um, I think that it would be nice if, if people could be a little more understanding of that. But uh, the other thing that I, I see and not just, not really just from fans, but from, people who are entering the industry is this notion of like, you know, show running is just sort of a job that you get, you know, <laughs> it's just a thing you can just apply for, you know, it's, it's a, uh, it's, it's, it's a thing, you know, that it's like, Oh yeah, I want to run, run right TV. And then I think I want to show run. And I'm like, wait, what <laughs> do you understand what you're asking for? <laughs> Cause what you're asking for is sure. You get to be on comic con panels and you get to be interviewed by the trades, but that is like the tiniest percent of the job. It's most of it is just grueling, <laughs> long hours, uh, time away from your family, like just, you know, being available to answer questions and crazy. Hours. Like, it's just, it's so much work. And I, and work that I really firmly believe you have to grow into through that experience of being a TV writer and a TV producer and, and seeing every single level of that vocation and being on set and being in post and, and, you know, learning the ins and outs. And so when people are sort of like, oh yeah, it's just like a, you know, sure. I want to be a showrunner, you know, or maybe I'll be a showrunner. You know, I'm just like, no, that's not, mm -mm, no, that's not a casual, casual (laughs) thing. Like if you're going to be a showrunner, you got to bust your ass for probably about a decade <laughs> to like earn your way there. Um, you know what is this? It's kind of I, I don't know if I don't know why this is the metaphor that came into my head when you were talk, describing it. But it almost reminds me of that scene in the first Harry Potter movie where they're like they're looking for that damn stone, and it's the one it's the the one person who wants it the least that or like it was, right. or is not like fighting for it. He or not not fighting, but not like trying to pursue it in the wrong ways. He's the one yeah. who gets it. Is it almost kind of like that analogy anal- right. you would go with? Yeah, I really think that if you're go if you want to be a showrunner for your ego, like mm -mm, that's that's going to end badly, Um, or you're going to be the kind of showrunner that makes everybody else's lives miserable (laughs) because you don't really know what you're doing. I think if you want to be a showrunner because you see how things can be managed better on a particular show, or you've learned really great lessons from really great showrunners, and you want to continue to 
you know, run the machine the way that you've experienced. And, you know, I, I just think that it's it's such a big responsibility that you have to go into it for the right reasons. And I, th I think your your metaphor is spot on because I find that the the people who end up being the most effective at the job are the people who do kind of stumble into it, you know, because they were there, they were ready and there was a need. And suddenly it's like, now it's you, you know, and understanding that like, there's a lot they need to learn or, you know, to, to prepare and, and asking lots of questions and, you know, going through the training program and, you know, things like that. I, I just feel like you just have to be ready for the amount of responsibility that's going to fall on your shoulders. And again, I think your goal should be to make everyone's working life as harmonious as possible. And that means you have to be ready to help manage all of that and make sure that the work environment that you foster is, um, is one where, where everyone knows what they're doing and everyone's prepared and everyone is communicating uh, fluidly and, and it's compassionate and, you know, hopefully diverse and, you know, where you're, you're open to a lot of other opinions and creative, um, creative input. Because I think when you're a really good listener, you're a better manager. I want to talk a little bit about that because again, this with, with Legends of Tomorrow, you know, you, got, you guys have, a, you know, a very passionate, uh, fun fan base and that comes with social media and so for you as a showrunner like as being one of the bosses you know how do you guys balance that with your writers room of how much does social media play into things or how you know where do you draw the line of okay you know like we can take a little peek here but not too much of like how you know it's almost kind of like opening pandora's box in a lot of ways i mean when i was you know on legends i think i was fairly active on social media. Not, not that much. I mean, most of my social media is Instagram and it's really just personal stuff. It's my baking projects and my kids and my trips and things like that. But um, <laughs> when I was on the show, I would post more about the show if there was something exciting to post, you know, but not really if I was just killing time. And certainly I wasn't lingering or lurking on uh, Twitter or anything just to see what was going on there. Um, you know, we would read reviews from uh, certain certain journalists who we whose opinion we trusted. You know, we were like, "Oh, that's interesting. That's that's an interesting take on that." You know, um, but I always try not to get too wrapped up on it. Um, and certainly, when there's anything negative, I really try not to engage because it just there's there's no winning that situation. <laughs> but generally like our fan base on legends were were really lovely and still are i mean we still have a very passionate um you know base of 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 wonderfully you know just passionate individuals who are still cheerleading for our show and and i'm so grateful for for the energy that they put out there um yeah i i there was very little negativity um certainly towards the end i felt like we fostered a pretty good rapport with our fans um and our you know our twitter handle our writers uh, Le legends of tomorrow writers room twitter and i tried to clarify things whenever i could whenever it made sense for me to put something out there but i tried not to get in the weeds of it because it's a time suck for one <laughs> it's like i don't have time yeah. it's like <laughs> i got way too much other stuff i gotta do not and not just as for my job and making sure that I can make this show for everybody. But, you know, I got, I got a busy, busy home life too. I got two kids, you know, I got, I got stuff to do. So I, uh, and these days I'm like not really on Twitter at all because I, I think it's, it's grown into just a very hateful space. So yeah. um, if you want to find me, I'm, I'm on Instagram. You can see all, all my sourdough bread. Um, I bake a lot of sourdough bread. <laughs> We were talking about the end there for uh, for a second, I, and I kind of want to, you know, because it's been over a year now since we lost our show. And, you know, again, I mean, I, I think a lot of us who have been following this franchise as long as we have, I don't think we ever expected it to go out in these ways because of network structure with Nexstar and everything. You know, can you can you take me back to that day of learning? You know, because, again, it was from you we learned that the show wasn't coming back. And 
you know, for, for your Twitter and so on. And like when you when you and Phil got the news, like like what? How much power do, do you guys have as showrunners of trying to, like, how is there any chance to save it? Moving it to another platform or like kind of just working out, like you know, like can we trim the budget for next season so we can at least come back for a couple episodes? Like how? What did that all look like? There, we were really powerless. I mean, once once a network makes a decision not to return, not to bring a show back, I mean, there's there's really nothing we can do about it. You know, there's there's no amount of begging or you know trying to negotiate. You know, the decision has been made at that point. You know, the only chance that we might have had was in you know, the early days of the final season. But at that point, we were just trying to get episodes written, produced, you know, up there. And it, it sort of came too late, these discussions of like, what if we have to end? Or what can we do to try to get people excited for next year? And we're like, oh, we are halfway through our season. <laughs> now you want to talk about this? You know, like, so it... um and we, you know, and we we tried, we did kind of everything they wanted us to in terms of getting a new character on board and, you know, getting, uh, you know, having an exciting, um, you know, potential next new season. And uh, again, I think there was just too many things out of everyone's control. Like even, you know, the head of the network loved our show. He was the one of the biggest fans and ultimately he couldn't save the show. So what could we do? You know, it was, it was, uh, it was out of so many people's hands at that point and financially just not viable for the structure of the new management of, of, of the network. You know, it just, it made no sense to have this, this type of show on their, on their platform anymore um, based on what they, they thought their, um, their target audience would respond to. So it's, uh, it was, it was really sad. I was already not planning on coming back. So I'd already sort of said my goodbye to the show, but I had hoped to leave the show, you know, in such a way that it was undeniable to get another season or at least a final season to wrap everything up. That's one of the reasons that we leaned into that cliffhanger as much as we did. Um, and it was sort of a little too late um, after the script had been written and was already in pre-production when someone was finally like, what if we want to actually end this? And I was like, are you kidding me? <laughs> Train has oh, left, yeah. left the station guys. Like, are you now you want to hedge your bets? Like we got to just, go full steam ahead. And, and I, and I, you know, I feel badly that for, for fans who who feel disappointed by the ending, I still love it in a way because it is such a legend's way to end things. Oh, 100%. <laughs> like, you know, I mean, like, like, yeah, like, yeah. You know, if this is the end, it's kind of a ballsy end. <laughs> and for a show that never did anything or tried not to do anything that was cliche or expected, I don't know. It kind of works, I think. So I, I, I feel bad if there are fans who, um, who are completely unsatisfied with that ending. But I do hope that some of them are at least can understand the sort of the joke of it and the fun of it. And knowing that like, yeah, in our hearts, the legends went to jail and had adventures busting out and, you know, it it was tons of fun. So I think that, um, you know, if we had had a more traditional closing of an ending, it might also not feel very satisfying to True Legends fans. The Showrunner Whisperer is brought to you exclusively by Multiverse of Color. Multiverse of Color is your home for fresh takes on the world of pop culture by established journalists and emerging content creators. It is your one-stop destination for a vast array of articles as well as audio and video production. Multiverse of Color features exclusive interviews, media event coverage, and film analysis. From Hollywood's biggest blockbusters to the most intimate independent projects. Visit multiverseofcolor.com for all the latest stories and follow Multiverse of Color through the social media links in the description below. And now, back to the showrunner whisperer. Yeah, I, you know, it's funny that you say that because I... As someone who covered, um, you know, the show from the beginning, uh, and you know, talk, you know, see, talk about what other fans and so on, like, I absolutely agree that 
that is a very lenders way to end but it, you know but at the same time the critic in me can also kind of see because because i don't know like how much you guys have been like told time because again i know the the news about the network possibly being being bought by next came out while you guys were writing you know like you guys are getting close to the end of season seven but how like how much you guys did you know that oh there's there's some shakeups coming up and like should we what support did, did the seat at the time provide for you guys in terms of like hey this 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 could be it like or like how, would they encourage you guys to no do a cliffhanger because one it I is mean, very it's very legend style but two we could see this coming back for another season it was uh i mean we knew obviously we knew of all the all the shakeups happening, the, you know, the potential sale, all of that, all of these were coming as we were again, very deep into writing and producing our season. And, you know, the, it didn't really seem like a possibility that we wouldn't get a chance to wrap things up in a satisfying way with at least a, a half a season. You know, we just, again, this was based on, you know, the decade plus of precedent really set by the CW and them always giving shows a chance to end things their own way, even shows that didn't have much of an audience, you know, they're always like, and there's going to be, you know, eight episodes to wrap this up, you know, so to us, and again, this was probably our hubris in a way, you know, we didn't, we just didn't think that it was possible that we would get cut off at the knees without a chance to to really make make a a, a satisfying um, conclusion. We just didn't think that would happen, even with these changes. And it didn't re- we didn't realize until it was kind of too late that that the discussions about like this is your last season you know, should have been had with us when we started season seven, you know, (laughs) as opposed to when we were like breaking the last few episodes or having had written the final episode. And then it's like, wait, what? Now you want us to tie things up? Like, uh, no, (laughs) we can't. (laughs) Um, So it was like, I think if we had had known, and I, and again, I, I don't blame the network for this because I don't think they really knew just how, how much the identity of the network was going to change potentially (laughs) Um, that season seven was going to be our last. I think if we had known going in, we put a, we could have pivoted fairly gracefully into a, into an ending that, you know, was, was still fun and um, irreverent, but like, you know, that would have feel more like an ending. (laughs) Uh, It just, it just happened too late. It happened too late that we were too busy pushing the season forward as we should have been, that's our job to really come to grips with the fact that all these shifts that were happening in offices far, far away from us <laughs> um, and far, far away from the people who we talk to every day about story and about the direction of the show. It was just like, you know, these were, these are numbers people. These are finance people. These are not people who ever watched our show or ever really cared. There was just people who looked at math and said, nah, this doesn't make sense. You know, we don't mm-hmm. want to do these kinds of shows anymore. So goodbye. Also, I, I'm also figuring that, that the pandemic played some kind of role in all this too, because I'm, you know, in, in another world, I almost imagine if COVID had never happened, like I, I could somehow still see a season eight somewhere like it, even if, even if it was just like five episodes, I feel like, because I know COVID really, it really shaked up a lot of shows up there in Vancouver for, you know, especially during the, for the first season of when the, the pandemic had hit and then things started easing up a little bit during the second year. Do you, do you think, do you think there's a factor of the pandemic having some sort of, sort of role of the show ending where it was? I don't, I don't actually think so, because I think honestly, we ran two very successful seasons over zoom, you know, uh, and remotely, you know, uh, at that point, our show was such a well-oiled machine and, uh, we just, we, we came up really with a really efficient man- way of, of breaking stories. So we were getting our scripts done in time and we were, we had two really successful, you know, financial seasons. I think we were, you know, we, we worked within our numbers and produced really high quality episodes. So I don't think 
that really dinged us. We never had a like a disastrous shutdown that cost tons of money that didn't go in. You know, we didn't we did, we managed to avoid all of that. So I don't personally think that that played a factor. If anything, like the fact that we we lost our writers' offices and started working remotely saved a lot of money. So if sure. anything, if we were able to continue doing remote you know, uh, remote writing, like, I think financially, it would have been fine <laughs> for them on their on their numbers, you know, ledger. So I, for our show, I don't think it really played a role, because we proved that we could do it really well, and more cost effectively, ultimately. Now, again, because you were talking about that, if season eight had happened, you, you were looking at season seven as as your exit how did you know that was the right time for you to leave like if you know, even if season eight had happened how did how did you know that this is time for me to take off to my next adventure for me it was really about i needed to move more into the type of storytelling that i'm really passionate about i mean i love superheroes i grew up on them i've got a batman tattoo like i mean i i am a firm lover of superheroes however I'd been writing superheroes for like 10 years. I, and I am not just a writer who loves superheroes. I'm also a writer who loves all different kinds of genre writing, particularly horror. And horror is, um, you know, emotional horror is something I've been trying, I've been developing in for the last, you know, about 10 years, you know, <laughs> trying to get stuff off the ground. So I, it was really important to me at that point that I not sign myself up for another, you know, round of superhero stories. I just needed to say, if I keep doing this, this will forever be the only thing people think I can do. And it'll be so much harder for me to get my shows that I am passionate about off the ground. If people are then like, wait, she's got this like, you know, this emotional J horror style show. And yet, she's been writing superheroes and she's still writing superheroes. So what is this? Like what's going on here? So at that point I had a pilot at Netflix. I was, you know, I had some other development that was, that was cooking, that was promising. And it just made sense. I was like, this is the time, this is the time, you know, I had uh, a one-year contract for season seven and I knew that when it was over, it was time for me to, you know, make a graceful exit. So that was, that was always my plan. And I, um, you know, again, I, I, I really wanted the show to survive without me. <laughs> and I knew it would have if it had gotten another season. It would have been a, a great season of TV. But I I knew I it, I needed to I needed to move on to something else. You were talking about, again, like having worked on some stuff before the strike and so on. Can you talk a little about what, what does your future look like right now? Like, again, I'm sure you can't give away titles or anything like that, but like, like what what is what is your next what is what is your next venture that you know that is even if it takes up time because you know again things are starting up again in the industry and so on but like what are you working on right now if you could tease us oh more? man <laughs> um at any given moment i've got like five things <laughs> that i'm like <laughs> we're in various stages of um out in the marketplace or getting ready to be out in the marketplace so yeah i've got a bunch of different right now adaptations i've got a couple of short story adaptations that i'm working on I've got a couple of novel adaptations that I'm working on. The one that was in the trades that I can talk about is uh, Night's Edge, which is a very grounded take on vampirism um, that I worked with the author uh, to adapt for Freeform. And that was before the strike. So we handed all that into Freeform and we're just waiting to see what they say. That's out there. So I can talk about that pretty openly. But and everything else. Uh, and oh, and I've got an uh, original that I'm sort of percolating on as well. But because IP is the thing that is selling these days, you know, the, uh, and I found out the hard way after pouring my heart and so much time into a fully original concept to only to have everyone be like, yeah, you know, the IP stuff, the stuff with the momentum is really where I'm leaning in right now, because I know that I'm really good with prompts. You give me a prompt and then I will make it my own. <laughs> so uh, I've found that uh, a lot of creative fulfillment in some of these like short story adaptations or novel adaptations that provide me a great backbone to work off of and then give me still give me the freedom to personalize it and make it really meaningful to me. So 
Again, I'm I'm mostly moving away from superhero stuff and really concentrating on, you know, science fiction horror stuff or um, sort of Japanese style horror stuff or, you know, really just compelling interpersonal drama that also has sort of that horror bent to it because, uh, you know, I like I like spooky stuff. Well, that, I, I, I have to then figure that when you guys, the season when you guys got your hands on constantly, that must have been just like... Like you know, because again, he's able to bring in such such a horror element to you know because of you know the demons and supernatural creatures he deals with, and so that must have been like huge for you is so, someone who loves horror that much. Oh, it was wonderful. I, I'm you know a big fan of the Hellraiser comics, and I loved the NBC show that they did with yeah. Man of Science. So I was like, I was yeah, it was it was really so exciting first when he had the cameo and then afterwards when he was able to get folded into the show full-time it was just delightful and matt is just such a wonderful collaborator and so fun and he was so passionate about this character too knew, knew so much and um had so many great ideas and it was yeah it was super fun getting to do you know every once in a while we do like a sort of spooky episode we could never go full spooky because of you know just the tone of the show itself but it was fun to dabble a little bit just get get some of those uh get some of that out there can I, something i've always been fascinated with you know being a showrunner for an era for a show in the eraverse is kind of like you know again you work with you know you talk about working with the studio and the network but also i'm sh- I, i've heard from you know from you know talking to someone like eric wallace or todd helping or mark guggenheim so about like working with dc in terms of what you can and can i do because i mean even though you guys in the latest and you guys you kind of balance it very f- nicely of having characters from the comics that people may not be as very familiar with, but then also creating new original characters like someone like Ava, Ava for example. Mm-hmm. How fr- fr- can you talk about from your perspective of how was it working with DC whenever you guys w- wanted to try and tap into those DC elements of like, before, when you got when you guys guys got Kid Flash, when you guys got Constantine, of like. Like was there like how 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 much freedom did you guys have with those characters, or was it kind of like? a lot of talks with DC of like, well, this is what kind of we want to see for them on our show. And this is what they want to see on their end. You know, they were always very supportive. I feel like they got on board with the tone and the uh, style of our show immediately. You know, as soon as we started making that pivot, they're like, Oh, this is fun. You know? And, and we never got pushback from them of like, you know, it'd be great if you took a more serious, you know, approach to this character because they're very important. No, no. They were always like, when they allowed us to use a character, they knew that we were going to do something a little offbeat with them. You know, Um, they, they kind of expected that. So they were never precious um, with, with their, um, their sort of allowing us to use things, but they, um, you know, but they, they, we didn't, we didn't request that much of them either. You know, we didn't, uh, you know, they were, they would always, for the first few seasons I was on the show, they would, um, you know, come in at the beginning of the season, like, here's some characters that might be fun for you guys to use, but they were never like, you have to put these characters on your show. Hmm. Um, or, you know, and if we did want to use one, you know, we'd, we'd sort of talk about ways to, to make it more ours. Um, and generally they were always very open to that. And, you know, when we talked about getting booster gold on the show, you know, they initially were like, well, we don't know because, you know, he's kind of tied up in features and blah, blah, blah. But they were excited about the notion of us bringing him on. And then, you know, when it, when it happened and we, we got Donald phase on to do it, like, it was just, it was really fun. And they were really open to like this totally different interpretation of this character and excited for where it could go. And and Donald is like such a super fan. Of, oh, I, he's you know, amazing. He's so delightful, but he brought just incredible energy to, to the role and to the set and everything. So I felt like DC was, was pretty consistently an ally for us in, in those types of things. And we just liked having the freedom of making our own characters at the end, which is why we stopped really bringing in people from the DC lexicon for a while, but we never lost sight of, you know, the value of having, having a a marquee name like that on the show. We just enjoyed, you know, sort of the blue sky of it all, you know? 
Yeah, but I mean, that's why, like, you know, for me, as someone, I mean, I'm Persian, for example, and I don't have, you know, it wasn't until Legends where I finally got Persian superheroes with both Zari and Barod, which, again, is, again, like, you know, again, like, being a show based in a big franchise like the DC world, but then still being willing to, because the other shows, I, you know, again, I, as much as I love the Arrowverse, the other shows, like, they didn't tend to create a lot of original characters every season. Yeah. But you guys were like again, like you, you brought in Zari, you brought in Vera, you brought, brought in Ava, like all these wonderful players that you know. I mean, again, again, if I mean, if DC wanted to, they could easily bring them into the DC world and you know really get them to exist there too. But the fact that you guys were willing to go to those legs or create these wonderful characters with or without a name attached to it from the comics, it is, it's it's very it's very inspiring. Again, because like I said, you know, if it was if you guys didn't have that mindset there i someone like me would probably never have persian superheroes persian superheroes uh on my screen because you know again i you guys were literally the first show that gave me that that representation which again this is i think that's one of the biggest legacies with legends of you guys really were giving a platform for the the minority voices the the the, the voices the, the faces we don't usually see on screen for you as a woman of color, you know, again being one of the few women women of color showrunners in this franchise, how how much did you did you feel that responsibility of that we are like this is the we are the show that really gets to bring break some territory here and make some history here. It was really important to me in particular um, for the very reason that you just stated. I, you know, diversity has uh, on on screen and behind the screen is is a very um, personal issue for me and something I'm, I'm very, very passionate about. So um, I think, yeah, I think it was in season three when, you know, uh, there were some discussions of like really wanting a, a character, uh, an exciting new um, uh, superhero to join our team. And at the time it was like, you know, Trump was in office. There was a lot of anti-Muslim rhetoric being thrown around. And I was just like, fine, but we need to make them Muslim. <laughs> I was like, we need a Muslim superhero on our screens now. And again, everyone was like, great, let's do it. You know, and 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 we did, you know, that was that was that that stemmed directly from a reaction to the hate that was out there and, and this vitriol that was being thrown around and us wanting to undercut it in whatever small way we could, you know? And, and then of course there's Zari, um, Zari, you know, originally Tomaz because um, Mark really wanted her to be, uh, you know, uh, a version of ISIS um, without calling her ISIS, obviously uh, from, <laughs> from the comics. Um, and then we, we moved away from that because it, was clear like she's not that character she's her own character and I really and again I was very emphatic that when the world got rewritten a little bit or her future got rewritten after season four that we give her a proper um Iranian last name I was like no more Tomas she is she's Tarazi like we need to go we need to go full <laughs> like proper representation here and not have this weird like fake last name nonsense anymore um, <laughs> and uh, and then yeah and then not just one but two um <laughs> bring her brother in and oh wonder twins yes the wonder twins and uh you know i grew up with a lot of siblings and i always wanted to have that sort of superhero sibling dynamic on our show because i just think it's so real it's so lived it's so um, so compelling um, to see siblings on on in the space. So I, yeah, it was it was really important that we we bring the sibling dynamic onto the ship and and yeah, I, I mean I think it was always a mission of ours to have the wave rider reflect the world um, and to have these um, points of view that would uh, you know at at one glance seem you know really disparate you know with one another, but then of course finding those sort of core human um, moments that would bring people together, people of all different colors, races, sexualities, um, um, identities. Like it was, it's just so meaningful. And I think lovely to see uh, a family form from people who you would otherwise think would never have anything in common with one another. I love, as a, as a, someone who is Persian myself, the, the thing you were saying about Thomas, because that was so funny. Because I, I, you know, my super, my my parents, they don't watch superhero stuff. But like when I was trying to tell them, hey, there's this cool Iranian woman on on the show I watch, and they were like, I was telling them the name, and they're like, 
Thomas? Yeah, that's like, really, that's, they're, they're like they're like that's not really common uh, for our people. I'm like I'm like well they're this combo character, but like she's called Isa, and they're like and they're like just their eyes just like I know there's so <laughs> they're, like, they're like they're like in 2017. There's a character named Isa. I'm like no no no, she was created like long time ago. We just don't say the name now. Yeah. But like, but like when after season four, when you guys you know reintroduced her. Uh, and again, because I, I still one of my favorite scenes of the entire series is when we are when we see Zari's home, her family home, and so on. Because again, like the way her parents act, that's how my parents act around yeah. me. Like they would, they would totally ask you, like, do you need to get a haircut? Like, you know, are you stressed? Are you hungry? Are you things like that? I was really trying to pay attention. To, like, I don't see any Persian carpets because if, in, in a good Persian home, there are carpets ah. uh, all over the place. But Mike, listen, listen, I get it. It is a CW. Like, I know money doesn't. It's Vancouver. Own. We're sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's totally fine. So, but no, but again, I mean, I think that's one of the things. Like, I and I understand why you know the. Um, why the pain was so there for a lot of people when when we lost the show because again this we don't have you know I mean, again uh, this was a year where like everything from you know pre DC Studios was just being taken away from us yeah. but this was one of the few shows where like so many cultures are celebrated and, and you guys are willing to really push the boundaries of you know again like listen like yeah we're the wacky show like we but also we can tell some freaking emotional stuff that will just have you bawling to, I mean again like who would have thought that something like Bebo would conquer the world the way it does now? Where like again, it's like whenever I see that blue little plushie, I just like I will either sob or I will be like, why is there not more merchandise for this character? I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, we were buying all our merch on Etsy. <laughs> Fan made merch. That's the only way I could get my merch, my legends merch. Yeah. Yeah. I um I, if I could just yeah, just asking as a fan because yeah, I, you know this is this is an opportunity where like we can kind of like go into you know some of the untold stories or whatever and so on because you guys when you guys finally got boosted because again I remember I was one of the fans that was like they're finally getting him like they were at, like, after seven years they're finally getting yeah. him is there anything you can share about how like again I know you said you were gonna that you you were leaning after the season but like did you know what they were pl maybe planning to do with him throughout uh, season eight if if it had happened? Because again, oh, with someone like Booster in this world with yeah. these characters, I mean, and again, you got again, Donald Fisher is such a spot on casting. Like that's why I'm like, like they are smart. Because I, I, I listen, Scrubs is one of my all time favorite shows. I know it's so good. Uh, so like, what can you, what can you share about about him? I mean, again, I, I can't speak to like specific storylines or anything, but you know, he was going to have kind of that, you know, that legends, that new legends arc that we always had with the new people who would come in where they'd start as like a, you know, a, a lovable, but completely untrustworthy, you know, frenemy um, and ultimately become part of the family. You know, that was, that was really the, the goal um, and to have him really become a staple on our ship. Um, and for him to, you know, to ever be Booster, who is pretty self-serving and driven by ego and rec wanting to be recognized and celebrated. And, you know, for him to suddenly find himself locked up with these kind of nobodies would have been kind of the ultimate humiliation. <laughs> and then to see him, you know, uh, with our team kind of get their way out of there and, and grow into to close friends was 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 really going to be, I think, the emotional backbone of his story. But yeah, you know, I, 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 I can't speak to, you know, anything specific because we never got a chance to talk about it and neither did anybody else. So we don't know. Because at some point you must have asked, but you know, like, you know what we could also do? We bring in Zach Braff and have him play someone. Close <laughs> to the third. Like, like that must have happened. Yeah, of course. Of course. We love Zach. And we, um, thought about him maybe being the voice of his little robot like having oh, that Jesus. yeah yeah we thought about that because that would have been an, an easy way to get zach in there you know it's like have him do the voice as opposed to trying to find money to pay for him to actually be on the show <laughs> yeah so i think that's that was what we were throwing around well again it sounds like this whole experience again like um even though the the final year may have been very been incredibly bittersweet. It's not like you really got to, you, you you got what you were looking for for the from the show of getting to grow, making your finding your space, and you know because now this is this has this job has now prepared you for uh, your future project as a showrunner. You must felt felt a sense of even though things went the way the way they did, 
I'm so glad that this was a show to prepare me oh, for. Absolutely. absolutely. Again, it was a very safe space. You know, it was a place where I, I always felt supported and nurtured and, you know, given these great opportunities to, but absolutely. Yes. I, I'm, I'm really, really grateful for the years that I spent in, in that, in the Arrowverse. I, I, I did grow. I did learn so much and it absolutely did prepare me <laughs> for all my, all my future shows. And I'll take the lessons that I learned there for, you know, to, to the next and the next and the next. Just another, uh, just another travel for another, another weight rider. Yes, exactly. But Kettle, thank you so much. It is a fascinating job to me of like how much really goes in creating a show, running a show. So thank you for all the things that you've done, you know, throughout your time with the Air with Food Legends tomorrow. I'm excited to see where you go next. I can't wait to see what horror things you're going to do. They're, they're going to scare the absolute crap out of me. Uh, <laughs> I love horror. I absolutely okay. do. But any, any final words, like, you know, for people who are listening, who, who have followed your your career over the last 10 years, anything you want to say to them who are listening? I'll just say like, you know, I'm just really, I'm really grateful for uh, fans of the Arrowverse. You guys are, um, you know, you've always such wonderful champions for the things that uh, I've gotten to work on. And I hope, I hope that I'll continue to make shows that people are excited about and uh, passionate about. And, you know, I hope to continue to drive you know, representation on, on our screens. Um, and also, you know, in behind the scenes to create opportunities for people of color and LGBTQ to really, you know, meaningful work opportunities. So that's, you know, these are my goals and I, I hope that can stand by them as, as, um, as the years go on. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to our little postmortem. I hope everyone enjoyed our first episode, our first interview with uh with uh, with Keto, with the, the one of the showrunners of DC Legends Tomorrow, I had such a good time chatting with her. I talked to her in the past a uh, few brief interviews, but this was a like, really the first time I really got to sit down and really go deeper into her job, her perspective of being a showrunner, and what it was like for her to take on such a, such a huge television adventure like Legends Tomorrow. And we're hoping to have her on in the future, of course, for her future projects. So uh, once again, huge shout out to her for being our first guest on the show, No Whisperer. I hope you guys had as much fun listening to it as I had fun conducting it because it was it was special. It was, again, a lot of things that I didn't know about her story uh, of going into Hollywood and then eventually becoming one of the showrunners for one of the longest running Arrowverse shows in the franchise. So... So with that, we're gonna we're gonna wrap up. We're gonna do some plugs, and then we will, we will see you in two weeks. If you want to find me, you can find me at Andrew Byte on all social media: Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, Threads, you name it. I will link to my link tree in, in this description, so you can find all my social handles. You can find all of my streaming platforms because I love to play video games. So Twitch, Kick, YouTube, you name it. Also, I am a senior writer for ScreenRed.com and I'm an editor chief of Multiverse of Color and a lot of different other projects. So check me out uh, in my link tree and follow, subscribe. But uh, for this podcast, you can find the Shona Whisperer at ShonaWhisperer.com for all the latest episodes here on Multiverse of Color. And you can email us ShonaWhisperer at gmail.com because again eventually we're gonna try also announce guests that are coming on so if you have questions for some of these showrunners use that email so we can maybe ask some of them when we interview them you can follow showrunner whisper on facebook instagram tiktok and freds all at showrunner whisperer on twitter that's right elon i ain't calling it x we're still gonna call it twitter at showrunner talk Follow these platforms, help us grow our audience online because we we know that the TV audience is huge. And we, you know, if you are on social media and you want to keep up with, with this show, hit that follow button. But also, don't forget to subscribe to the show and whisper on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher Radio, iHeartRadio, Amazon Music, Podchaser, Audible, and all the available platforms that exist out there today for podcasts. I will link to all of them in the show notes below, uh, both on YouTube and on the blog post for your audio listeners. And also, if you just if you have a couple of minutes to spare, hit that five-star rating review on Apple Podcast. It would mean so much to us. 
if we could get that support because that is one of the best ways to not only show your appreciation for the podcast and for the show, but also elevate us further on our podcast listings so that more people can find the podcast. And here's the thing. I'm always here for feedback. As I said at the start of the show, if there are things we can improve upon, please let me know because I'm here. To, we're always here to evolve and grow, uh, especially for me as a content creator, a podcast producer and host. So please let us know what did you also enjoy from this first episode? What was something, what was something that surprised you about hearing about Keto's story as a showrunner for the first time? Let us know about all these things in your Apple Podcast reviews or your, the other platforms that you listen to your podcast at. And five stars really does go a long way, guys. So if you could do that for us, would deeply appreciate it. But but that's going to be it for episode one of the Shoner Whisper. We'll be back, like I said, in two weeks with our next guest. And I'm excited for you to hear, hear their story. So again, for all of my team members here on the Shoner Whisper and for Multiverse of Color, I'm Andrew Bagged. Thank you for listening to Shoner Whisper. And I will see you on the next one.